Welcome back to part two of the European segment of the third edition of Regeneration International's People's Food Summit. And now we will go to Croatia, where we're going to meet our friend and partner, Dr. Irina Ateljevic from Terramira, and share with you the fantastic work she is undertaking to create rural regeneration in a post-conflict zone in Croatia. I remember my grandmother's skirt and hiding under it when we would dry the figs. I remember the sweet yellow peaches and the tiny bitter cherries. I remember the olive trees. This place used to be full of life, full of famines that lived from the land. It was the belly that fed all central Dalmatia. The war and mass tourism changed a lot of things around here, and now it is mostly abandoned. Nowadays the food comes in trucks, not from the ground. The tiny cherries and the sweet yellow peaches are to be found only in a few lucky gardens. My name is Irena, and I came back to find the forgotten trees of my childhood. Terra Mira is a center for regeneration. Here we want to plant the beginnings of a native fruit forest. The knowledge is still present and we are catching it just like a sweet ripe fig before it's gone to preserve it. It is about creating a healthy community, regenerating not only the land, but also the village, bringing life back to this place. After years of teaching and studying sustainability worldwide, I wanted to walk the talk. I realize that the richness of our biodiversity is disappearing from the our feet. That is why we are planting these trees and creating a seed bank. I invite you to be part of this. Plant a tree with us and come. Come to taste the fruits. Bring your ideas for workshops residences, working actions. Become a creator in this story. We will provide the fertile soil. Each tree is a chance. Just like every journey begins with a single step, the transformation of an entire community begins with a single person and their vision. My name is Irena. I'm a mother, sister, daughter, a scholar and researcher. At the peak of my academic career, I made a life-changing decision to return to my native Croatia and apply the principles of regenerative development that I had taught at universities around the world. It was then that the vision of Terra Mira was born. Terra Mira is not only my home, but also a center for regeneration and human potential. It's a place where we sow the seeds, both literally and figuratively, of a thriving future community. One that lives in harmony with the land and all life through food production, education, art, culture and sustainable tourism. Terra Mira stands as a symbol of resilience and a renewal. It was built with the help of international volunteers and local artisans in an area that had been ravaged by war. Embodying the spirit of regeneration, we reused the stones from the ruins of an older home. Join us on the Regenerate Europe platform 
where we can channel the collective efforts of change makers to make Croatia and Europe a fully regenerative society by the year 2040. Seeds for generations in Croatia, where I originally come from, um, they have given the livelihood and the power to my people and my grandmother who only lived from the land. She was planting these seeds and growing olive trees and fig trees and the vegetable garden. And, and then I, um, I took off to the world, have become a professor, a big professor on sustainability. And then I realized, as it, as it shows in video, but I'm only talking the walk and I'm not walking the talk. So I decided to come back to my uh, home country to honor my grandmother and my grandmother's land where I could see so many unsustainable practices around the world and what could I do to honor um, the love that she had for the land and what the land can give us. So I'm using this as a, as, as a very powerful reminder what's how important seeds are for our sustenance. But also I would like to use uh, their symbolic power. And um, then we go on to the second part of my story and my travels around the world. Uh, when I met um, Dr. Vandana Shiva in Delhi in her office, surrounded by all her books and amazing research um, uh, library. And we had such an inspiration talk and I knew her from my PhD study on ecofeminism and so on, and been always inspired by, by her work. And I was doing a lot of my own activist work and social projects also in India, and when I lived in New Zealand and later when I was in Netherlands and teaching in Bakken University. And um, after that talk, um, she recommended we go to her um, organic cafe within the craft market in New Delhi, um, were run by Navdanya, the organization to promote of the um, uh, farmers to promote the seeds and, and organic produce. And me, me and my daughter were there and we had a lovely meal of so-called forgotten crops. And, um, and that was, uh, you know, very powerful to see this in the cafe. There were tables uh, um, with the glass on the top and underneath you could see all of those little seeds of those crops. And we know Vandana does this in order to promote biodiversity and so on. So I, it did really, she planted a strong seed in my mind. Oh my God, this is such a powerful way to educate people, especially in the urban environment. So that was 2015. In that same year, we were also organizing the Subversive Festival in Zagreb, decided to invite her to come to speak there. And in the same year, I think Regeneration International was um, uh, founded in June. And then we had the in November COP21 in Paris. My daughter went there and uh, Regeneration International was launched at that event. Uh, and my daughter met all these amazing uh, heroes and heroines of regeneration movement, Rob Hopkins, unfortunately now our late Ronnie Cummins and Andrew and Andre and everyone else. So we uh, we began with uh, with this project uh, in the coastal town nearby here nearby Teramira and near the island where I originally come from, and we decided to set up an organic bistro, very much similar like the model of uh, Vandana's uh, cafe in Delhi, where we wanted to provide vegetarian organic um, uh, uh, produce directly from the farm to the table. At the time, that that concept was very alien in Croatia, still very, although we are only talking about that eight years ago, but we were really pioneers in that. And we had educational space above the bistro. It was a social enterprise and we really struggled with the sources of local produce. And then we found this um, beautiful area of Terra Mira in this abandoned village um, that was affected by the war, um, the civil war between Serbs and Croats in the 1990s. So this village used to be uh, over 700 people, mostly farmers who were actually feeding um, most of the region. Um, and um, they all left to the urban centers, left at the time of the war. And so we bought the, the land, um, we inherited some 
um, mostly almond and olive trees for producing um, cold press olive oil, really good quality organic olive oil. Uh, but we um, wanted to bring in other fruit trees, the figs and peaches and cherries and apricots and so on. As we know, that's the key to regenerative agriculture. However, the next uh, summer after planting, we realize uh, we have, and I have to um, uh, stress here that before 1990, we actually didn't have a chemical industrial agriculture because we were as you know, it was a communist Yugoslavia. We didn't belong to Eastern Bloc, you know, Soviet Union Bloc, nor to Western Bloc. So we uh, didn't have the import from the um, industrial food corporations with hybrid uh, seeds and uh, and. Uh, uh, pesticides. So we actually didn't call it organic back then, but it was by by default, it was organic. But unfortunately, with opening up um, to the global markets, we now get all this poisons and Roundup and, you know, um, and because tourism has come uh, more and more massively, a lot of people are not doing the land. So when they do olive trees or figs or whatever, they are just going with the easy way of uh, putting the glyphosate under the tree so they don't need to mulch and, and, and do all of the land work. It's just easy and then it kills all of the grass and the weed. And people are really not aware how, how harmful that is for our human health. So that's one of our um, uh, uh, purposes here to really create that awareness. And I can attest that is now really becoming more and more apparent that this is what is important to, to, um, to take into account and, and people are taking care more of their land because they realize they affect their own health, not just selling it to others, but they drink this, I mean, eat this olive oil and so on. So um, at that time when we also kind of got this uh, uh, international volunteers uh, team, they were also getting close to our local shepherds. We have a uh, small community, mostly older people who are uh, still tending their um, animal sheep and chicken and, and, and geese and, and they give us their natural compost for the trees and, and you can see it in one of those videos you're going to show um, how uh, that has been such a beautiful symbiosis, uh, even though the local community doesn't speak much of English but international people, young people learning from locals. And so I really see Terra Mira being that important catalyst for bringing, you know, the, the world to the local and the, lo you know, the locals bringing them closer to, um, to, the, to the world. So in these efforts, we are doing some more um, of that um, organizational collective um kind of projects that can give them more visibility and more reaffirmation because i find that now even some younger people they produce beautiful goat cheese and and uh, beautiful gems and you know there are some local artisans who make a beautiful iron uh, fences and you know there's a lot of local knowledge but they think oh that doesn't give us a livelihood anymore no one cares it's easy to go to supermarkets and so on so I'm now showing this that by bringing international people, we also uh, rent this house uh, over the summer. We, we sell the local produce to visitors. So we are we're reaffirming local people that what they do, we cannot lose, but only produce more and do better and be more integrated. So to that um, object objective, we have two now projects coming up. The one that I want to start is with the women's, women's cooperative where I want to integrate some of those small um, uh, pro food producers who don't have a time, no energy, no, uh, no skills to sell or market or or you know to really reach the, the markets and the and and the um possibility to sell that easier. So in the cooperative, uh, we will um, integrate them under Teramira brand and want to encourage them that they start to focus on even more organized uh, food production, of course, organic food production. So that's one of the um, uh, of our also collective uh, impact that Teramira uh, does. Another one, which is very exciting, and now it's just about to, to begin in collaboration with 
and um, uh, the county. Uh, I've been approached by the deputy mayor of county in relation to regenerative tourism strategy that I have developed for the nearby coastal town of Shibenik, because that's also one of the kind of work I do, um, advising public sector on importance of regeneration. So I last year I developed a regenerative tourism first of that kind in Croatia and um, and uh, making this uh, uh, central piece of the strategy. There is no regenerative tourism without regenerative organic food. And when you look at it, the shocking facts that actually Croatia imports 80% of their food needs. That's for me, I just can't accept that. We have so much of abandoned land. I can see this in the, you know, I mean, this is very fertile valley and the, the whole of the region used to be so uh, full of agricultural produce that now we just import food from Europe and the rest of the world and not producing our own. And when you think that tourism is one of our biggest industries where we receive more than 20 million uh, international vis uh, visitors, you know, I mean, hello, you know, you have to feed these people with your own local food. So you see the power of regeneration already there. It's um, just by connecting tourism that is huge in Croatia with regenerating our uh, food, uh, local food supply, organic regenerative, we can totally regenerate really Croatia to that, uh, to that end. So now Deputy Mayor wants me to pilot a project here at the, at the level of this region and the county that we create Regenerate Croatia brand, where we would identify the best practice examples, organic produce, to see the needs of those farmers who don't necessarily have the certificate, but they do organic. So that we really connect them uh, to identify what local farmers need, teach them on the design and all of that and how it can really feed into this uh, awareness of the importance of regenerative food and then connect it to the hospitality sector and the tourism sector. So that is sort of one of the visions that we now um, have uh, in the near future, hopefully with having um, a local distribution center where the farmers could bring their, their food and where they, they could sell it all and they could be distributed then to supermarkets and hotels and so on. So that leads me to the final aspect of, of uh, my work here, which is quite big one, I know. Uh, I just launched it in April this year, uh, this uh, uh, gathering a kickoff event of a platform called Regenerate Europe, uh, where I invited um, uh, successful social entrepreneurs and food producers from Croatia, from Portugal, some of the experts from Netherlands, you know, and we wanted to cover multi sectors, not just the food production and agriculture, but also urban design and education, and of course, in tourism and travel, and also um, personal regeneration, because that's very important. We know that a lot of activists burn out in their efforts and how it is important to be to take um, you know care of our own personal uh, well-being and then how we take this to the communal level and to the planetary level so this event um, uh, proved to be very successful we did it in a split in collaboration with aspira college um, we get it around 60, 70 people. Now we have the platform. It um, resonated so much within uh, the community and the, and the delegates, and we decided now to do the second one in 2024. Um, we, we are only now working on it, um, uh, on the program and how we're going to go about it. Um, we will do it probably in this region, within because I'm close to the National Park Kirka which is um, also an amazing scenic um, region. So I might uh, do it with the, in collaboration with the National Park Kirka. So um, I use this opportunity to invite, uh, you know, all our beautiful regeneration um, community, international global community to join us at this event so that we can see how we can promote further uh, and create greater visibility for, for, for our movement that we so strongly believe in. So, um, so what I, I can only say, I started with the power of seeds and I really, I can attest this with my very rich life of traveling all around the world 
um, educating, uh, seeing so much, much of my students doing some amazing projects and initiatives around the world because I also planted the seeds of change in their minds, how important it is to believe in the power of seed, seed symbolically and uh, literally physically, um, because this is where we can, from which we can create more beautiful world that our um, hearts know it is possible to quote Charles Eisenstein and his beautiful book. So to, to create the world that works for all. So I invite everyone to plant as much as you can, beautiful trees and organic gardens and join our regeneration movement. Let's do it for the sake of our children and uh, for sake of this beautiful planet. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of Terra Mira, which by the way, I didn't forget to say, Terra Mira stands for the peace of, for the land of peace. Mira Mir in Croatian means peace and Terra is the land. And that's the symbol of this project to be in the post-war conflict era um, area and to create such a project that gives the hope for more, you know, positive future where people can live in peace and harmony. Thank you. Meni je svako i dan kad vidim da sam ostala živa, da mi Bog podario, ja sam sretna. Kažem hvala ti Bože što si mi daj ovaj dan da ga živi. Ja mi smo naučili da radimo teške poslove i da da se borimo. Ali ja sam opet sretna što sam živa i što mogu da radim. Što mogu da radim, da obavljam posao, da idem, da krećem se. Ja sam, u tome sam sretna. Ajde, ajde! Ajde, vidite se, ajde! Ajde, ajde, tako. Ludo vam je tako. Ovo se jede. Niki ne jede. Aha. Ovo je zdravo. Za mene znači ljubav biti ovako sretan i zadovoljan. I da smo ovo dvoje živi i naša djeca. To je za mene nešto najljepše u životu. And we thank Dr. Irena and the whole team of Terra Mira. We warmly invite you to join them in Croatia. Next up is Miss Yannick Schoenhoven from La Junquiera Farm in Spain. Yannick, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, my name is Yannick Schoenhoven and I am speaking to you from La Junquiera, Spain. We are a regenerative organic farm uh, here in the south. I love to share what we've been uh, busy with uh, over the past 10 years with you all. This is a, a little image of uh, what our farm village looks like, La Junquera. So basically, La Junquera is an 1100 hectare farm um, in the south of Spain, in the something that we call the drylands, the Altiplano, which is the highlands. Um, and we are struggling, like uh, many areas in the south of Spain, with uh, a lot of degradation. Um, a lot of uh, issues regarding uh, different rainfalls, uh, less water availability in the soil, and um, depopulation in general. And this is something that we at La Junquera are uh, trying to transform. Um, because we love to live in a place that is thriving um, and therefore we are 
developing La Junquera as a regenerative organic farm. But not only that, we are working um, with several educational projects. Uh, we have a, an academy on the farm called the Regeneration Academy. We have um, a volunteer project uh, on the farm called Ecosystem Restoration Camps and several entrepreneurs that live with us and uh, make yeah, this territory a better and more sustainable place. Um, so at this exact moment, we are over 15 people living full time on our farm. Uh, people coming from Spain, of course, but also Italy, the Netherlands, um, even Mexico. Um, and together uh, within our several projects, <clears throat> we are working to, to restore uh, the landscape. This farm got into the family of my husband already uh, over 200 years ago. And it started with an esparto, which is this grass type uh, farming, uh, then went into cereals, and when uh, the tractors came, the whole village that used to have over 150 people started to empty, and only one full-time worker was left, and the land started to degrade a lot, um, which is something that happened yeah, almost everywhere, I would say, um, and it's something that we'd be struggling with to change over the past uh, 15 years. Um, we see not only land degradation as a problem here, um, we see also that there is a very big knowledge gap uh, in the rural areas when it comes to how to change these problems and what we can do about them. So we see a lot of use in experimentation, in, in research uh, done on the farms to transform these agro uh, food chains. Um, also because many people say, yeah, I, I don't know what to do, uh, and everything is so risky. And as long as it stays very risky, uh, people will never transform on a, on a bigger scale. And another thing that we've seen over, over the past, yeah, 15, 20, maybe longer, uh, years is a lack of hope and inspiration. So especially in the rural areas, we see that people leave, uh, young people, they, yeah, their parents tell them, yeah, please don't, don't do this because don't stay here. There's nothing for you. Uh, it is a poor region. It's an empty region. So go to the city and find your life there. And something that we really are trying to do is to, to get them back uh, and to say, hey, you can actually live here. You can live here very well. You can even live on your farm and, and enjoy uh, and make a living uh, while doing that. So that is something that we also try to show with our farm, with the projects that we do, um, that it is actually possible to make a living on the farm while doing regenerative and organic agriculture. <clears throat> so something that, I'm going to keep that here, something that we are uh, busy with is not only the farm, uh, we are actually busy with regenerating a whole valley. So we have two farms, which are 30 kilometers apart. And one farm starts uh, at the start of a, of a river. And the other farm, where the river should pass by, has no water anymore. While 10 years ago, it still had. So the river would be passing by that other farm. So what we're trying to do is to uh, regenerate 30,000 hectares of land. Um, through regenerative practices, um, we are going to start very soon with working together with uh, different farmers in the watershed. Um, we are training them into soil health, in water management, in uh, several practices that can improve the water uptake of the soil. Uh, also, we're going to um, be talking about pollution. How can we prevent pollution from happening to this river? And it is something that everybody can stand by because water in the end is everyone needs it, everyone wants it. And um, in, therefore, this is not a, it doesn't have to be a conflict. It can be something that we are all uh, very eager to work on. So this is the bigger project that we're working on. Um, 
Of course, this is a very long-term project, especially in a dry land area like ours. Uh, but we feel very confident that uh, already in five years, we will see the river coming a lot further than it came before. Um, we are working together with a lot of other farmers. We are uh, working together with uh, local schools. So also training high school kids uh, about farming, about entrepreneurship, uh, showing them what is possible. Um, we are working with uh, young farmers in short courses. We are working with international agro-food professionals also for in short courses. So anyone who's interested to learn about regenerative agriculture uh, can get a hands-on experience on our farm. And we do this because we feel that this network and this knowledge on regenerative agriculture really has to grow. Um, people have to understand what it means on a real farm. Um, they have to understand that some things are really not as simple as they seem in the theory. Uh, like, for example, a, a no-till is very possible in some places and very challenging in others. And we try to show these different um, practices in different uh, ways and in different fields and, and show that sometimes, um, yeah, it's a lot more complex than we wish it was. Of course, we're working with regenerative agriculture. Uh, for us, it is not only about uh, improving the soil, in, but it's also a lot about improving uh, livelihoods because we feel that, yes, we can improve the soil, but we also have to um, transform mindsets so that these soil improvements are also going to keep happening in the long term. Because if they don't, yeah, why do we even start, right? So we do feel that to make this work, we need to include the whole community. Uh, we need to help each other, uh, learn from each other, do experiments, probably fail at some of them, like we do a lot, uh, and then start over again. And that is a lot more feasible if we can do it together. So that is something we always try to 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 say that for us, the, the regenerative agriculture part is just one part of the puzzle, um, but we also need to regenerate the mind. So some of the successes we've had so far is uh, we've had over 50,000 trees planted in natural areas. Uh, 10,000 people were educated. Um, we built over a hundred ponds of which I would say half have water all year round. Um, and we are starting a holistic grazing uh, management system, which is challenging in our area because, um, yeah, there was no cow grazing. There's no cow grazing in our province. So, um, yeah, even in the organic certification, they said that it was not possible to have the cows outside. They had to be inside and otherwise we would not get the organic certification. So there are some challenges uh, in that sense, but we are working together with the authorities to, uh, to make it work. And um, we do strongly believe that um, the animals can also help to improve the soil if managed correctly, um, and that their uh, meat can also be very healthy if managed correctly, of course. Yes, yeah, so I told you a bit about the Regeneration Academy. We have a lot of courses uh, for local people, but also for international people. We do a lot with students. So we have a four month research program during which students come to write their thesis or their internship here. And for the people that uh, don't want to do a course or don't uh, study anymore, uh, there is also Kampati Planet, which is the ecosystem restoration camp that is uh, responsible for the natural zone restoration. So both on the farm and uh, in the Valle del Kipar, that is um, Camp Altiplano, who is managing the, the restoration of the natural zones, working with volunteers from all over the world to make this happen. 
and planting a lot of trees and bushes uh, to get some of this um, very degraded uh, natural land back in shape. Uh, with our farm, we are not only farming our own farm, but we are also helping other farms to trans transition. Uh, so we are working uh, with uh, investment funds. We are working with uh, specific farms that uh, go from conventional to organic and regenerative. And uh, we uh, do the services on their farms. Um, this is something that is relatively new for us, as in we have been now doing this for four years, but it works very well. And we now do know the trick uh, on how to uh, to do this. And that is, that is very helpful. Uh, so actually we have these four companies uh, and entities working together on our farm that for us really make it work. Uh, because we do store, yeah, we believe that it's very difficult to do it alone. And, and I know a lot of farmers, you have to, you don't maybe have so many companies or things around you. Um, and that just makes it very challenging. Uh, so we are extremely lucky in this sense to have been able to work um, together with all these, uh, these great people. And uh, we've also noticed that the more people are involved, the faster this transformation uh, goes. Um very happy to uh, to have been able to speak here. And um, if you have any questions, you can go to, to our website. Uh, we also have an Instagram that is the same name. And uh, there you can also find more information about the Regeneration Academy, Ecosystem Restoration Camp, uh, and other ways to get involved with us. Thank you all for listening and um, hope to see you on our farm. Thank you. Soil is the most important thing we have in a farm. It drains uh, 125 millimeters in two days. And you can see here how it only gets wet like the first part, that is like about 20 centimeters. Then you can see the power of uh, absorbing and retaining water that it has, this has. You can imagine that by increasing like one millimeter of, of topsoil of organic matter in one hectare, then your capacity to store rainfall is increased by millions of liters. I, I remember we were in the kitchen, I think having dinner with my father, I think I was 10, 12 years old. and. Uh, we were talking about the farm and how he was worried that it seemed that the, the plots were getting more stony and more rocky every year. There seemed to not be an answer for that. It was happening to every other farm. People assumed that that's how it was. So I was quite shocked about it. And from that moment on, I was quite interested or worried in finding solutions to that. Years later, I started hearing more about organic farming and regenerative farming. They seem to have answers to not only not pollute the soil, but also to improve it and reverse that process of getting a more and more stony land. The climate that we have here in this region is a really harsh one. They're very close to a desert climate. Our biggest challenge here is the water. How do we get the most water in the ground? And how do we keep it? How do we make sure it doesn't leave the farm? How do we make sure we use most of it um, and it's a big challenge. When you drive here, you see the landscape being a brownish. And then sometimes you see these really super green patches, which is broccoli and lettuce farmers. That's a crop that extracts a huge amount of water from the aquifers. Unfortunately, it happens a lot and it's very profitable. So every farmer gets the offer to have his land rented out to a big supermarket and they use it for five years and then it's depleted to the bone. It doesn't make any economic sense to, to mine something and to mine your farm and then do it for a few years and then you cannot use it anymore. My father always told us that 
he saw himself as a steward of the land and that his goal and duty was uh, to manage it and uh, give it, pass it on to the next generation. The farm that we live in has been in the family of Alfonso for 200 years. Until seven years ago, we had mainly a monoculture of grains. I thought there was room for improvement and for new ideas. Most of them were related with a more organic, regenerative concept of farming. Regenerative agriculture is basically a set of practices that are good for the soil, that are healthy, that are increasing fertility on the land. Some of these practices are about water management, like ponds, swales, sediment traps. Others are more about the soil, like uh, using compost, having ground cover. Others are more about biodiversity, like making natural areas where uh, insects and pollinators can, uh, can live. So there's more holistic uh, view of, of farming in which you include livestock, in which everything relates a lot more to each other. I think farms should be constant innovation and experimental places. I came with all these ideas of basically trying to do new things. The answer in general, it is surprisingly always a no, like that's not possible. Trying to grow other varieties of uh, wheat or barley or rye, no, that doesn't work here. Well, then we tried and uh, most of them, they did work here. In the case of almonds now, this is too cold and high for almonds, but then we have a lot of almonds and it works even a lot better than grains. Growing pistachios, yeah, that doesn't grow here, but it's quite surprising because nobody even tried, so how do you know it doesn't work? We're trying to do these uh, swales, well, that doesn't, it's not going to work, they're going to break down and they're not really hold uh, that much moisture. We had uh, 125 liters of rain in two days, in 48 hours which is a lot, a lot, a lot. And one of the things that we do on this farm to, to manage uh, rains and to, to capture as much water as we can is uh, by making swales. And swales are, are basically contour trenches and they stop the water. And then the water gets redivided uh, amongst the contours of the plot. So there you can still see that there's a little bit of water. So you really see how how much sediment it got, <laughs> this much. And the, the 10 centimeter topsoil is basically where you have the nutrients. They are the ones that have the minerals, the organic matter. So this is the stuff that you want to keep on your land. And normally, it would have all flooded away. So with this farm, we're really trying to, to showcase the possibilities and also give some tools to, to do this transition. Yannick is now mainly focused with a project that is the Regeneration Academy. Students from all over the world that want to do her, their master thesis. Many of these kids, they will end up in, in important positions. They are making decisions about agriculture on a European level. Bringing that sense back of, of giving something better to the next generations is very important. I think that's where regenerative farming fits really well. The climate is constantly changing and the market is constantly changing, therefore your techniques and your crops have to be constantly changing as well. Thank you, Yannick Schoenhoven. Please, those of you that are in Spain, please do go and visit this amazing project. And now we're going to the UK to meet Miss Bonnie Welch, who is the head of projects for the Sustainable Food Trust, who's going to give us a presentation on the SFT's plan to feed Britain from the ground up. Hi, Oliver. Thank you. Um, my name is Bonnie Welch and I'm head of projects at the Sustainable Food Trust. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you as part of the People's Food Summit, and I'm really pleased to be able to share a recent piece of work of ours which looks at the future of sustainable farming uh, in the UK. So the Sustainable Food Trust is a UK-based organisation, and our mission is to accelerate the transition to more sustainable food systems. Um, they're systems that work in harmony with nature, that combat climate change, and that promote public health. We do that by carrying out research, uh, by delivering projects and campaigns and through our high level uh, advocacy and policy work. And as head of projects, I actually oversee 
quite a bit of that work, uh, particularly our work on food and farming education, on beacon farms, um, and also on our Feeding Britain uh, research. And that's what I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you a little bit more about today. So the Sustainable Food Trust work is informed by an understanding of truly sustainable farming systems that work in harmony with nature. And they're systems which are based on a biological approach to farming without the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. They integrate crop production with livestock production wherever possible, particularly here in the UK. They reduce and recycle waste both before and after the farm gate. They promote a diversity of crops, of genetics, of farm enterprises, and importantly, biodiversity. And they are uh, systems which deliver social and cultural benefits, um, including higher levels of, of employment and also job satisfaction. And as you can see here, a transition to truly sustainable farming in the UK would involve moving away from the extractive farming systems that rely on high levels of inputs and have uh, will generally cause quite considerable damage to the environment, to systems which are healthier, that regenerate the soil, that improve biodiversity and produce high quality nutrient dense foods. However, as many of you will know, there are some significant barriers to change, including a lack of enabling government policy, little economic incentive here in the UK to farm sustainably, sustainably and also public confusion about what to eat to be healthy and sustainable. And to address some of those challenges and in answer to that final point and the question on many people's minds about what should I eat to be healthy and sustainable, we carried out research um, looking at the impacts on land use, on food production and on diets of a nationwide transition to sustainable and regenerative farming in the UK. And our research was based on this premise that we should all align our diets to the outputs of sustainable farming systems in the countries or regions in which we live. So feeding Britain from the ground up is our piece of research which came from that very premise. And the good news, and we'll, we'll go into this in a bit more detail in just a second, is that broadly speaking, a transition to more sustainable systems could produce enough food to maintain and potentially even improve on current levels of self-sufficiency, provided, and this is important, uh, that we ate differently, that we ate less, and that's in line with European health recommendations, and that we reduce food waste. And the following short sequence of films that you're about to see um, explores our modelling in more detail and reveals the specific impacts on land use and uh, food production and individual diets. Thank you. The food that we choose to eat and the farming systems that produce it are of crucial importance in relation to climate change, biodiversity and public health. That's because more than half of the habitable area of our planet is farmed. And because our current farming systems are intensive, they have been one of the major causes of greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity loss and damage to public health. But we mustn't blame the farmers. They've simply been responding to agricultural policies which have encouraged the globalization of food supply systems and have forced farmers to intensify their methods of production. This has led to farming practices which have degraded soils, reduced biodiversity, polluted our landscapes, negatively impacted on animal welfare and of course produced huge amounts of waste. So, the current intensive farming system isn't working for farmers, for the environment, or for us. But it doesn't have to be like that. Across the world, more and more farmers would like to transition to farming systems that work in harmony with nature. Producing healthy food, in ways that also encourage high levels of farmland biodiversity, help tackle climate change, and make more efficient use of limited resources. We know farming in this way is possible, 
but questions are often raised about whether such systems could provide us with enough food and whether our diets would have to change if we adopted them. To address these questions, we carried out research into the implications on the farmed landscape of a national transition to sustainable food production. We calculated how much food and of which kinds the UK would produce if all our farms were managed in ways which worked in harmony with nature. So our first task was to establish the key elements and principles of the farming systems which would replace those we have at the moment. Systems which produce sufficient quantities of high quality, nutrient dense food, avoiding the use of non-renewable inputs, address climate change, restore soil fertility and biodiversity, and promote the health and well-being of the system as a whole, including the plants, animals, and people. Common to all sustainable farming systems would be the use of crop rotations, the practice of growing different crops year on year, which allow farmers to naturally build fertility and tackle pests and weeds without the use of large quantities of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Key to this is a rotation with a restorative phase where the land is planted with grass and clover and often grazed by livestock, which, as well as helping to build fertility, tackle weeds and boost biodiversity, also providing a key source of food and income. We then set out to identify the most appropriate farming systems for each of the wide variation of different climate zones, soils and landscapes of the UK, ranging on the one hand from extensive grassland systems for the high rainfall hills and mountains of northwestern Britain to the more productive systems in the fertile lowlands. The food productivity from these different farming systems would of course vary considerably, ranging from mainly grazing livestock in the uplands to system producing cereals and pulses, vegetables and fruit in the more fertile areas. So if we applied this approach nationally, what would be the key changes resulting from the introduction of these sustainable food production systems? A key feature would be a nationwide return to so-called mixed farming, with most farms moving away from monocultures where one type of food production is grown year on year to a system producing a much wider range of enterprises and of course foods. As a result of these changes, total grain production of crops such as wheat, barley and oats would fall dramatically, perhaps to less than half of present levels. As a result, we wouldn't have enough grains to feed intensively managed chickens, pigs and dairy cows, which currently eat half of all the cereals we grow. Feeding such huge quantities of grain and soya to livestock is an immensely wasteful and damaging practice. So these systems would be phased out. This would mean a more limited role for pigs and poultry compared with the present, with a return to their traditional role as recyclers of food and crop wastes. Food distribution systems would also need to change, with more crops being grown for local consumption, including more grains and vegetables and fruit in the west of Britain. And of course, local systems for slaughtering and processing livestock would also be needed. As a result, we would see an increase in the number of grazing animals in the east of the UK to enable farmers to turn the fertility building pastures of their crop rotations into food that they can sell and we can eat. Dairy herds fed on grass and byproducts from crop production would also become a more common livestock enterprise in the east but grass-fed beef and sheep production, as well as pastured poultry and outdoor pigs, would also be introduced. Crop production would of course still be an important enterprise on many of the more favoured farms. 
with a variety of crops, including fruit and vegetables grown as part of crop rotations. Specialist horticulture would also find a key place, with regional and local biologically intensive systems based on compost producing much larger percentage of the seasonal vegetables and fruit that comprise the sustainable diets of the future. The same would apply to towns and cities, with peri-urban farms playing an important role in providing nutritious, healthy, affordable and local food for urban citizens. For those beautiful yet challenging conditions on the uplands of Britain, grazing by hardy breeds of cattle and sheep kept at low densities using grazing systems appropriate for the habitats would provide major benefits to a huge number of species. So too with the integration of trees and livestock, a practice known as agroforestry, as well as providing habitats for woodland species, growing trees alongside food crops would provide another source of income for farmers and critically help draw down very significant amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. We believe that by transitioning to farming systems that work in harmony with nature, Farmers can find a right balance between food production, the restoration of nature and the delivery of a nutritious and healthy diet for our nation, the shape of which is the subject of our next film. In our first film, we looked at the way in which farming in the UK could be adapted to address the serious threats of climate change, biodiversity loss and declining public health, highlighting the need to restore the balance between food production, wildlife and the environment. In this second film, we'll explore the implications for our diets because the only way that sustainable farming systems can thrive is if we eat the foods that they produce. The first question that we need to explore is, if sustainable and regenerative farming practices were applied right across the UK, how much food would be produced overall? And secondly, how much of each food type could we produce, including grains, vegetables and livestock products such as meat and dairy? So let's examine the key findings. If sustainable farming systems were adopted nationwide, there would be major changes in productivity. On the one hand, we would be able to produce more fruits and vegetables and pulses such as peas and beans, and about the same amount of lamb and beef with less dairy production. On the other hand, we would produce far less grain, perhaps 50% of current levels, and much less chicken and pork. Prices would also need to change to reflect these changes in output, and we would need to adjust our diets accordingly. Why is this? The key change in food output relates to the avoidance of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. This is because the only way that farmers can avoid using chemicals is by introducing crop rotations which include fertility building pastures and often grazed by livestock, then followed by a succession of crops including vegetables, grains and pulses. Under a sustainably farmed Britain, our fruits and vegetables would be grown in a very different way. Instead of the majority being grown intensively in the east of the UK, a far greater percentage will be produced on mixed farms throughout the country, resulting in better tasting, more nutrient-dense produce. The production of cereal crops, like wheat, would fall by around 50%, but we'd still have enough grain to eat. 
although there wouldn't be enough surplus to feed intensive livestock. So we'd have to stop eating cheap chicken, pork, and dairy products from intensive herds altogether. Instead, we'd have livestock systems, free range, welfare friendly, and working with the grain of nature from smaller herds where the animals would get out to grass twice a day during the grazing season in the case of dairy cows. We wouldn't produce quite as many eggs as we are used to, but they would be of much better quality from pasture grazed free range hens. Another key finding of our report is that we'd still have plenty of mainly grass fed beef and lamb to eat, as these animals will play a crucial role in helping to build soil fertility during the rotations by eating grass and providing manure on mixed farming systems, transforming grassland into food that we can eat. In this way, mixed farming systems can combine vegetable, cereal and livestock production, thus helping to restore the landscapes with livestock products being very much part of a sustainable diet. To help farming change for the better, we will need to eat differently. An individual diet rich in fresh fruits and vegetables grown sustainably in the UK, combined with high quality grass-fed animal products consumed in moderation should be the future of sustainable diets in the UK. So a key question we need to ask is not, should I eat meat and dairy to be sustainable, but rather, which meat and dairy is the most sustainable? And then, how much of it can I eat? And we should be asking those same questions about our fruits, vegetables and grains too. Not all diets will be the same, of course, and there will be variations depending on dietary preferences as well as religious and ethical considerations, all of which can find a place in our future food and farming systems. The most important thing to consider is where and how our foods are produced, as these factors have a huge bearing on the environmental, economic and social impact of our food choices. Our Sustainable Food Trust report on future diets indicates that if we want to eat sustainably, we should switch to eating the foods which come from the sustainable farming systems of the future. To explore what that would mean in the UK, we researched the impact of a countrywide adoption of sustainable food production to our future diets. How much food and of what kinds could the UK produce if every farm in the country were managed in ways that work in harmony with nature? And what would that look like in terms of individual diets? The report challenges several of the orthodoxies which currently prevail on food waste, on affordability, and on the role of livestock in sustainable food systems. In this short film, we will respond to the key concerns in relation to the farming system and diets that we are advocating. On food waste, reducing and ideally eliminating food waste is an absolute priority. This could be achieved partly through advances in technology and the application of the polluter pays principle and through farming systems reform to align our future food production to the principles of the circular economy. On equitable distribution, it should be a fundamental human right for every citizen to have access to high quality, nutrient dense food. But to achieve this, both during and after the transformation towards sustainable farming, governments will need to step in. 
subsidising and underpinning the pricing system for lower income groups, providing, for instance, free school meals and other forms of support, such as public procurement, food on the public plate. On affordability, many people are understandably worried that the introduction of a truly sustainable and regenerative farming system could make food unaffordable for a substantial percentage of the world's population. Whilst it must be an absolute priority to ensure that good food is affordable to lower income groups, in truth, the apparently cheap prices that we have become so used to are dishonest because they don't reflect the damage caused to the environment, to the climate, or to human health. We are advocating a change in policy where a combination of the polluter pays principle is applied and subsidies are redirected to encourage a shift to more truly sustainable forms of food production. A further area of concern comes from the farming community who are understandably worried that if our producers adopted regenerative and sustainable farming systems in the UK, they would be undercut by imports of food produced to lower standards. To address this legitimate concern, we believe future international trading agreements based on farm sustainability assessments could offer a solution. The Sustainable Food Trust is developing a global farm metric which if it were adopted by the international governmental community, could ensure that in future only sustainably produced foods will be traded tariff-free on the global market. Linked to this point is the structural reality that continuing food imports will be inevitable in many countries, including the United Kingdom, since our population exceeds the structural capacity of our land to feed it. Few of us would want to be deprived of access to a range of foods which cannot be produced in our climate zone. On this point, it is important to note that our report recommendations are solely related to the staple foods that could be produced by our UK farming community. In order to realise our vision of a sustainable food future, we need to adapt our tastes and our diets to support the food products from the farming systems which will best suit our climate and our landscape. And in relation to imports, we should restrict all our purchased foods from overseas to farming systems which meet those same criteria. If we can do that, whilst at the same time addressing the stark inequality which prevents people in lower income groups from having access to high quality nutritious food, then we can truly co-create the food and farming systems which we need for the future. My name is Toby Anstruther, I farm at Balkaski and we farm about 3,000 acres of mixed farm. We've just taken off the last harvest from the last of the conventional fields and started transition to take the whole lot into organic. When I started farming here at Balkaski it was conventional farm. It did have livestock but we really kept the grain and the livestock quite separate. And like so many farmers, we were fighting against the sort of crush of costs and prices at the other end, and really just being a commodity farmer, driving costs out of the system all the time. And what really resonated with me, what struck me was that if we headed on down this route, we were gonna end up with a farm I didn't really wanna live on. That we would end up basically with one or two huge fields and no veggies, no livestock, no wildlife, and with really awful soil having drawn everything down off it and we were going to be competing with what's grown in a lab or what's grown on the huge, huge fields in other parts of the world. So for me, it was completely unsustainable to carry on like that, and I knew that I had to make a change. 
The simplest change for me, in a way, was to decide to get off the drug of the chemical farming. But really that was just the beginning and what I found is that as we moved organic, a whole lot of other things had to change. We had to change the scale of what we were doing, we had to change the nature of our crops. So we've moved to heritage varieties, not so much for fashion or their interest in the market but particularly because they're deep-rooted, they're longer strawed, so the light doesn't get to the bottom, you don't get so many weeds coming up. It's been really, really interesting, the change over to organic, because it suddenly put us back in touch with what the essence of farming is, that we're capturing sunlight uh, and we're making the most of the soil. And if we look after those two things, then I think we can produce really fantastic food at reasonable cost so that it's available to anyone that needs it. Thank you, Bonnie Welch, and we wish you all the best in your mission to feed Britain from the ground up. Now, the closest country to the UK is France. So naturally, naturellement, we're going there and meeting farmer rancher Cédric Chabrol. And Cédric is going to give us a presentation on the work he is undertaking on his farm using regenerative organic practices inspired by the works of Gabe Brown. Salut, donc je me présente, je m'appelle Cédric Cabrol, euh, je suis issu du monde agricole, mais comme je n'avais pas la patience de traire les vaches, je suis parti dans la recherche en chimie, euh, où j'ai travaillé pendant 22 ans, et puis euh, quand on a de la terre sous les chaussures, eh bien, on revient à tout ça, donc euh, au début avec de la permaculture, du jardin, et puis euh, mon frère était allé aux états unis euh, il y a 8 ans, euh, voir la conférence régénérative, où il avait entendu de nouvelles idées, des choses où on pouvait stocker beaucoup de carbone. Il m'a expliqué que ce que je faisais dans mon jardin, ce n'était pas bien, que l'important, c'était les racines, la diversité. Et du coup, j'ai monté un projet agroforestier, parce que je faisais un peu d'apiculture aussi, à vocation, un projet agroforestier à vocation apicole. Et du coup, comme les sols étaient libres, il y avait 5 hectares et que c'était très contrasté, j'ai dit ben, on va étudier cette expérience que tu as vue aux États-Unis et on va voir ce qu'on peut faire parce que ça faisait déjà 20 ans que j'étais soucié par ce CO2 à aller jusqu'au travail en vélo, etc. Donc, euh, je vais vous parler en ces temps où la vache est de plus en plus sur la sellette. Euh, une autre façon de, de l'utiliser qui peut-être euh, pourrait être en plus une très bonne solution. Euh, donc, euh, je vais vous montrer un petit peu euh, les expériences que j'ai pu répliquer euh, à cet endroit, qui est une photo qui a été prise euh, sur la parcelle où ont lieu les expérimentations, et c'est pour voir comment nous pouvons stocker vachement de CO2. Euh, donc, l'histoire démarre avec euh, l'intuition d'un Américain qui s'appelle Gay Brown, qui, il y a 20 ans, a eu l'idée de, de faire pâturer ses vaches comme des bisons, puisqu'il était sur des terres où autrefois les bisons pâturaient. Et ça, c'est un détail qui peut peut-être tout changer. Euh, donc, on va voir comment. Donc, Gay Brown, voilà, c'est cet homme. Donc, ce qui nous présentait et qui m'a interpellé, c'est euh, ce graphique d'évolution de, euh, de son sol qui change de couleur, mais aussi euh, pour les spécialistes qui dit qu'il monte jusqu'à 11% de matière organique, ce qui est absolument énorme. Donc, il n'y a pas de tromperie sur la marchandise. Là, ici, on a du sol qui, qui apparaît en haut dans le coin et qui renvoie bien à... C'est bien la couleur d'un sol à 11% de matière organique. Donc, du coup, j'ai voulu comprendre pourquoi. Et à partir de ce graphique, j'ai tracé une courbe d'évolution de la matière organique qui pourrait être celle-ci et qui est tout à fait en adéquation avec ce que peut nous raconter Olivier Husson dans sa conférence des cercles vicieux de la compaction, où on assiste, il prévoit un changement de potentiel. Et donc, Gay Brown, à l'autre bout de la, du monde, a déjà réalisé ce changement de potentiel. Donc, si on reprend un peu l'historique, parce que j'ai lu son bouquin uh, « From Dirt to Soil », que, que mon frère m'a prêté. Euh, du coup, c'est entre autres un des Américains qui avait vu euh, mon frère euh, aux États-Unis. Donc, du coup, il a arrêté le travail du sol, puis il a diversifié un petit peu ses cultures. Puis, à un moment donné, il a subi énormément de, de problématiques climatiques avec des sécheresses, des inondations, de la grêle. Et il n'a pas eu de trésorerie, donc du coup, il a arrêté de mettre de l'azote. Et aussi, il y a eu beaucoup de, de, de couverts et de choses qui sont revenues au sol. Pour fabriquer l'azote, il a mis des couverts intercalaires. Donc ça, maintenant, c'est assez la mode de mettre des légumineuses pour fabriquer l'azote. Euh, et puis, quand il a de nouveau eu de l'argent, il est retombé dans la drogue. 
de la drogue azote, et il a rencontré une professeure, qui est le docteur Chris Nicole, qui a dit qu'il fallait vraiment qu'il arrête l'azote s'il voulait améliorer son système. Et du coup, c'est ce qu'il a fait, il a remis des couverts multi-espèces, avec aussi, il a parlé des notions de biodiversité, qui étaient importantes, et du coup, il a entamé un sevrage d'azote, euh, réintroduit l'élevage, euh, qu'il a fait pâturer autrement, et... Euh, mis énormément de diversité d'espèces. Maintenant, aujourd'hui, il a une centaine d'espèces. Et c'est comme ça qu'il a pu faire son saut de potentiel. Donc, cette notion de diversité est très importante puisque chaque plante va héberger à ses racines des cortèges bactériens et mycorhiziens spécifiques qui ont la capacité de, de, de créer une richesse au niveau des minéraux, etc. Et ça, on va le voir un peu plus loin dans la présentation. Euh, J'ai une autre slide. Ce qui est important, c'est que euh, on épaissit énormément l'épaisseur du sol et on a une photo qui nous le montre. Et après, je m'étais livré à une série d'estimations du stock carbone qu'on peut avoir euh, derrière en fonction de différentes hypothèses. Et j'arrivais à cette courbe où, au final, euh, l'intégration du stock carbone serait de l'ordre de 450 tonnes de CO2 à l'hectare, ce qui est absolument monstrueux, euh, surtout sur une si faible durée de temps. Et aujourd'hui, on a un autre Américain qui a répliquer cette expérience qui s'appelle Ruchel Hedrix et lui il n'a pas repris la drogue au milieu donc en 10 ans seulement il est arrivé à ce total de, 9, de 450 tonnes de CO2 à l'hectare avec des teneurs en matière organique de l'ordre de 8,2 en surface et 6,5 en profondeur donc <coughs> du coup euh, j'ai aussi là dedans quand je me suis intéressé à ça les agronomes en France m'ont dit oui mais Gay Brown il est dans un climat euh, il y a beaucoup de périodes de gel euh, il a une, donc c'est normal qu'il stoppe du carbone il y a aussi, ça doit être du carbone mort il ne doit pas avoir de fertilité et du coup si on regarde un peu au niveau de la fertilité j'ai essayé de collecter les éléments analytiques qu'il communiquait et ici vous avez euh, trois boules qui sont euh, l'azote, le phosphore, le potassium et le carbone qui sont présents dans son sol et c'est en molaire donc c'est le nombre d'atomes qu'il pourrait y avoir euh, du coup j'ai retrouvé d'autres analyses où il a publié après vous voyez qu'il a pas mal augmenté euh, du coup, moi, ce qui m'a intéressé, c'est de dire que c'est peut-être bien réel parce qu'il évolue. Euh, et en tout cas, si on compare aussi au niveau de l'agriculture euh, biologique euh, ou euh, sans travail du sol, ce que j'avais noté, c'est que ce qui était intéressant aussi, c'est qu'il a été mauvais, euh, mais que quelque part, aujourd'hui, dans son système, il est bien meilleur que ce que peut être un bio ou quelqu'un qui ne travaillerait pas le sol. Et aujourd'hui, alors c'est apparu derrière ma caméra là, mais on voit que les, les boules sont vraiment stratosphériques euh, puisqu'il trouve 320 unités d'azote dans son sol en temps réel. Euh, le phosphore et le potassium, c'est énorme. Le carbone organique aussi, c'est vraiment euh, phénoménal. Et ici, je présente aussi euh, ce que je peux avoir dans mes meilleures zones de, de mes parcelles où je suis déjà dans une logique où je ne mets pas d'azote et vous voyez qu'il y a déjà pas mal d'azote. Euh, donc euh, j'ai aussi voilà, une zone un peu plus dégradée comme dont on parlera euh, par la suite euh, et une zone très dégradée euh, où je vois qu'en appliquant ces méthodologies j'ai déjà une petite évolution alors ça c'est des choses que je présentais il y a deux ans et entre temps on va voir ça a bien marché chez moi aussi euh, je, donc je notais qu'on pouvait avoir de la progression rapide j'ai aussi analysé des écosystèmes donc vous avez là, là on a une prairie naturelle j'ai aussi une zone de, où il y a des orties et de la ronce pour montrer ce que ça peut donner. Et j'ai aussi ma serre qui, qui tournait bien, où il y avait de belles plantes. Les petits pois peuvent, peuvent faire 3,20 mètres et les framboises aussi. Voilà ce qu'il y avait dans le sol. Euh, donc tout ça, euh, ce qu'on voit, c'est que dès qu'on met de l'azote, eh enfin, on a moins d'azote dans le sol. Et donc peut-être voilà, utiliser autrement euh, les animaux peut avoir de l'impact. Donc, une notion qui est très, très importante là-dedans, c'est que, et ça, c'est une publication qui vient des États-Unis, c'est Critters, qui, en 1955, a noté que lorsqu'on effeuille les plantes, au début, eh bien, on conserve toutes les racines, et puis, arrivé à 50 des feuillages, eh bien, petit à petit, on va tuer les racines, et même si on laisse 20 de feuilles, on a déjà tué toutes les racines. Donc, j'avais l'intuition que ça pouvait être très important pour aller chercher l'eau et reconstruire une nouvelle plante, mais aussi, si on y réfléchit, on a on permet à la plante, pour moins de feuilles, d'aller de, chercher plus de minéraux. Et quelque part, on peut gommer les effets de carence. Et ça, on va le voir, je vais l'illustrer après avec des analyses. Euh, donc, je vous présente ma zone d'expérimentation. 
qui est un, un terrain très contrasté, où euh, là, on a une, une, une vision de, de ce que peut être la distribution de la matière organique sur la parcelle. En fait, ce qui s'est passé, c'est que la personne, il y a une légère pente, et la personne qui travaillait, là, euh, labourait en envoyant le, la terre dans la pente. Donc, il y a eu énormément d'érosion. Mais ça, du coup, pour l'expérimentation, c'est très intéressant parce que ça permet d'avoir... Euh, Gabe Brown a démarré de 2, il est monté à 6. Moi, ça me permet de tester les expériences à plusieurs étapes de, de son processus. Quoi. Euh, donc, du coup, euh, voilà une photo de, de, de la truffière. Euh, J'ai une zone un peu plus au seuil de fertilité, on va dire, qui est la lisier. Et une zone où ça pousse très, déjà très bien, qui est, qui est le bon coin, qui est une ancienne prairie naturelle. Et si je vous remets... Euh, donc, et aussi, dans mes expérimentations, j'ai testé à rentrer des oligo-éléments avec des pulvérisations foliaires. Euh, donc là, c'est des choses... Euh, c'est chimique, mais c'est de la chimie soft où on met des oligo-éléments qu'on donne euh, euh, aux plantes comme quand on prend des compléments vitamines, nous, quand on n'est pas bien. Quoi. Donc, vous avez ici une vision de, de, des différences de pousses qu'on peut avoir en juxtaposant. Vous voyez qu'il y a... Euh, restaurer les sols, ça peut avoir un réel intérêt pour la croissance des plantes. Donc, pour aller voir un peu plus dans le détail euh, au niveau des oligo-éléments, donc ici, ce que je présente, c'est ce qu'il y a dans le sol, par exemple pour le zinc, que j'ai dosé pendant quatre ans. Et on va s'intéresser à l'effet de, de la pâture sur le, ce qu'il peut y avoir comme oligo éléments dans les feuilles des plantes. Donc, j'ai commencé à faire des analyses avant de faire les pâtures. J'ai aussi, un mois après, je suis revenu après pulvérisation ou en ayant laissé des, des plantes entières. J'ai aussi analysé, quand j'avais pâturé, que 30% des feuilles, juste avant qu'on casse les racines, en fait. Et j'ai aussi euh, étudié ce qui se passait quand on avait rasé les plantes, que, que, les, que les moutons avaient trop pâturé. Donc, voilà ce qu'on obtient. Bon, le graphique est assez compliqué, mais on va se focaliser sur un seul élément. On va regarder sur la truffière, qui est une zone, en fait, où on voit qu'il y a très, très peu d'oligo-éléments présents. Malgré ça... Euh, alors, avant pâture, on avait des plantes qui étaient limite carencées, puisque le, le seuil usuel correct, c'est ce rectangle. Par contre, euh, si je laisse les plants sans pâturer, on voit qu'ils s'affaiblissent, il y a moins doligo Par contre, si je pâture, je vais au-delà des, des zones usuelles de, de target euh, usuel. Et alors, je n'ai pas le plan rasé à cet endroit-là, parce que ce n'est pas évident des fois de de ménager des bandes de témoins, etc. Mais on voit que, par exemple, dans la zone la plus fertile, si je pâture totalement, j'ai dégradé la situation des plantes. Voilà, donc le, le seuil de, de pâture est très important. Euh, alors, pour, pour, alors, je vous présente quelques photos de, 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 des choses, comment ça se passe sur le terrain. Donc, ça avait des couverts multi-espèces et j'ai choisi de montrer cette photo. Alors, ça, c'est la zone qui est assez fertile. Hein. La zone fertile est là sur le côté. Mais, mais ici, on est quand même dans un bas-fond de vallée pour la partie euh, de droite. Hein. Et je voulais montrer quelle différence il peut y avoir, quel intérêt il peut y avoir à travailler un couvert multi-espèces par rapport à une prairie naturelle. Vous voyez qu'on n'a pas du tout les mêmes biomasses. Donc, ça aussi, ça peut aider à, à faire avancer le système parce que c'est comme ça que Game Round nous dit aussi. Il nous dit, je mets des couverts intercalaires multi-espèces hein. Et donc, j'ai travaillé, moi, tout le temps en mettant ces couverts et en hiver et en été. Euh, j'ai aussi une vidéo, alors je suis désolé, elle est de mauvaise qualité, mais je te la ferai passer en meilleure qualité, euh, où je montre, voilà, j'ai utilisé des vaches et des moutons. Et alors, les mout dans le bon coin, je n'ai pas pu avoir de bonnes modalités de prature parce que les, les, les plants étaient beaucoup trop hauts pour les moutons et ils avaient tendance à casser tous les pieds pour pouvoir les manger... Euh, ce qui les intéressait. Bon, puis il y a une, une petite, un petit clin d'œil à mon chien qui se régalait de, de faire ça. <rire> voilà. Euh... Voilà, là, on voit un peu plus les vaches. Bon, enfin, en fait, on organise un saccage en règle parce qu'aujourd'hui, on ne fait plus ça parce qu'on euh, a l'impression de perdre toute la valeur de, du troupeau. Il y a énorme, toute la valeur des couverts. Il y a énormément de pertes au sol. Et, et c'est pour ça qu'on ne fait plus ça comme ça. Et ça fait 10 000 ans que les hommes ont interdit aux animaux d'aller euh, pâturer euh, dans les couverts comme ça. Euh, là, par contre, on a des, des choses qui ont été beaucoup mieux. C'est la truffière. C'est cette zone où j'ai réussi les, les, les pâtures depuis deux ans parce que c'est beaucoup plus gérable. C'est à la hauteur des moutons. Et puis, en même temps, comme ça va très, très vite, je prenais le temps de rester sur place pour euh, stopper les opérations au bon moment. 
Parce que là-dedans, il y, y a une notion de seuil qui est très importante donc, pour conserver les racines. Euh, et euh, si on regarde, si on compare un petit peu l'impact que ça peut avoir sur le stockage carbone, donc ça, c'est des choses que publie Gay Brown. Il nous montre euh, les différences qu'il peut y avoir entre des pâturages continus ou euh, un pâturage tournant dynamique ou ce qu'il fait lui. Mais je pense que pour comprendre les choses, il est important de retourner ce graphique Euh, ah oui, en fait, ça présente les taux de matière organique en fonction de la profondeur de sol, mais je pense que comme les racines vont vers la profondeur, il est important de placer ce graphique dans le bon sens, si je puis dire. Euh, et ce qu'on voit, c'est que suivant les modalités de pâture, donc on va avoir des stockages carbone bien différents. Si on, on pâture euh, vite... Ah ouais, là, je fais une pause. Tu couperas au montage Quand on va pâturer, qu'on va couper toutes les racines, on va avoir euh, ce type de, de profil de stockage carbone. Donc là, je l'ai remis en couleur pour que ce soit plus visuel. Euh, donc, ce qu'on voit, c'est que comme on coupe les racines, on va stocker du carbone que sur 25 cm. Et après, on a un peu de percolation du carbone dans le profil, mais ce n'est pas génial. Si on fait du pâturage tournant dynamique, on accélère les vaches. Et là, du coup, elles vont moins manger et on va avoir un meilleur stockage carbone. Et vous voyez qu'on en a plus en profondeur. Et alors là, c'est passé très vite. En fait, quand on fait le mob grazing, on dynamise les troupeaux comme s'il y avait des loups présents sur place. Et ça, c'est des choses qu'on a empêchées il y a 10 000 ans. Et ça a beaucoup de sens, en fait. Ce qu'on a compris sur ma parcelle, et là, je fais une petite pause, mais je n'ai pas d'image pour illustrer, Mais vous avez vu que la parcelle est très hétérogène et je, moi, les moutons, je me les suis fait prêter, les vaches aussi. Et au début, j'ai travaillé avec les moutons et le, le berger, je ne pouvais pas lui dire prête-moi des moutons et puis repart et puis reviens et puis repart. Donc, on a choisi de, de prendre un moment où c'était bon, où il y aura assez à manger pour son troupeau. Et ce qu'on a vu, c'est que quand on a mis en œuvre les, les brebis, j'avais un, une zone où il y avait des avoines qui étaient très mûres. et qui était au stade de l'étepateux. Et le berger m'a dit, non, mais ça, c'est pas grave, on n'a pas l'habitude de faire ça, mais, mais peut-être c'est comme si on leur donnait de l'avoine, et peut-être ça fera un flushing, et on aura le, le troupeau qui tombera en chaleur tout le temps, en même temps. Et en fait, c'est ce qui s'est passé. Il euh, y a eu euh, un pic de fertilité de, du troupeau, et qui s'est traduit même derrière par 30% de gémélité en plus. Du coup, l'année d'après, on a choisi de rester comme ça, et de dire, on va cibler ce stade de plante. Et Ce, ce berger, un jour, quelques années après, m'a dit « j'ai une brebis qui s'est faite attaquer par un loup ». Et je dis « bon, comment tu sais ça ?» Eh bien oui, parce qu'en en fait, il ne mange que le foie et, le, et les poumons. Et je lui dis euh... « eh ben, ben oui, parce que si tu devais être un loup, que tu devrais courir après un troupeau, euh, tu ne vas pas te charger la pince avec, euh, avec euh, 3 tonnes de bidoche. Il faut que tu restes léger et rapide. Et du coup, tu prends que les minéraux. » Et en fait, si on y réfléchit, les vaches, les, les brebis, avaient un repas très riche, euh, complet pour elles, qui leur permettait de, garder, de gagner la ligne, puisque le laiteux pâteux, il y a beaucoup d'eau dans le grain, il y a de la protéine et des sucres. Donc du coup, elles restent mobiles face au troupeau. Et donc, si on leur laissait le choix de traverser les continents au rythme où elles aient choisi, eh bien, elles iraient naturellement sur ce stade. parce que ça leur donne la fertilité, parce qu'elles sont super contentes quand elles sont dessus. Franchement, elles sont frénétiques et elles ont un sourire jusqu'aux oreilles. Et, euh, et par contre, du point de vue de la plante, elle, elle était en train d'avoir sa descendance. Et euh, au dernier moment, elle s'est faite manger ses grains. Et ce qu'on a vu, c'est qu'elle avait tous les minéraux dans la sève pour être, faire une bonne photosynthèse. Et du coup, euh, ce qu'elle fait, bien, elle continue à faire la photosynthèse et elle le met à profit de sa dernière graine ou des graines de ses nièces et de, de, de ses cousines pour euh, mettre ce carbone dans le sol. Et en fait, elle le met sous forme de polymère hydrorétenteur qui va stocker immédiatement l'eau. Donc, au, avec le carbone, au lieu d'avoir de, de la matière organique qui va so stocker 7 fois la quantité d'eau, Eh bien, on va pouvoir avoir un polymère qui stocke avec un gramme de carbone 100 fois la quantité d'eau. Et donc, ça, ça change la donne immédiatement. Et en plus, voilà, on met le carbone sous terre. Au lieu de l'avoir juste en surface, comme dans le cas du surpâturage, on l'enfouit au fond. Et ça, c'est ce qui explique qu'on accélère les choses. Donc, du coup, voilà ce que montre Gay Brown. Ça, c'est la motte claire. On a, changé, on a laissé les, le, les vaches deux jours. Euh, au même endroit et là on les a changés deux fois par jour 
Et euh, on a aussi des indices, ça c'est un pâtureur, c'est Alan Williams aux états unis qui montre que les meilleurs pâtureurs qu'il a dans son lot, eh bien, ils ont des choses assez étranges et ça c'est assez reproductible. On évolue à 0,5 points de matière organique par an à peu près, mais c'est rare, hein, ce n'est pas tout le temps. Et voilà moi ce que j'ai pu voir au, au Pérounel en suivant en fait euh, mes sols année année après année, voilà les évolutions que je constate. Les pointillés c'est pour du 30 pour 1000 Aujourd'hui, je pense qu'on a des points qui sont à 200 pour 1000 sans problème. Et si je prends ces, ces points, que je les remets en lien avec la, la courbe qu'on a tracée de Gay Brown là au début, voilà ce qu'on obtient. Donc, on voit que c'est assez superposable au stade où on est euh, dans la fertilité. J'espère qu'on pourra aller vers le grand saut, même si malheureusement, aujourd'hui, le troupeau est parti dans le nord. Et ce n'est pas évident pour moi de continuer les pâtures, mais je continue à suivre les... Euh, les parcelles. En tout cas, pour l'évolution que j'ai eue euh, cette année, il n'y a pas eu de pâture, il y a eu la canicule et le système a continué à évoluer. Euh, Peut-être on a permis de, de développer des populations, de rééquilibrer les populations et ça a continué. On verra à l'automne, là je réanalyse. Et après, ben, si on, maintenant on fait le lien, si on revient à la question de la vache, comment on l'emploie, est-ce qu'on peut l'utiliser ou pas on est obligé de, de parler de méthane. Euh, donc, si on fait de la bibliographie, on voit que le, la quantité de méthane émise par les bovins est très variable en fonction des, de la façon dont on l'alimente. Euh, ça peut aller d'un impact carbone de 9 tonnes par an par, euh, par animal à 1 tonne et demie. Euh, donc ça, euh, ça dépend de la qualité de l'alimentation et si on est riche en oméga-3 et en oligo et des mains, etc., euh, ce qu'on voit, c'est que là, eh bien, on a vu que quand on fait ça comme ça, l'alimentation est correcte. Donc, on peut supposer qu'on ait des vaches qui émettent moins. Et là, c'est la valeur du, du bison en fait, que je suis allé chercher dans son écosystème qui a été mesuré par une publication. Et si on met en regard euh, le CO2 qu'on pourrait capter, voilà le, là, on est sur la même taille d'atomes de, de carbone en noir. Donc, on voit qu'il n'y a pas de débat réellement. Euh, dans tous les cas, on compenserait les émissions euh, méthane. Et si on fait des calculs sur la quantité de carbone qu'on pourrait stocker, euh, voilà ce que nous montre le film Kiss the Ground. Il montre qu'on pourrait réfléchir la, la courbe de CO2. Et moi, j'avais fait les mêmes calculs avant d'avoir voir le film et je trouvais les mêmes ordres de grandeur. Voilà, donc, euh, et enfin, là-dedans, j'ai introduit une notion qui est importante de pouvoir piloter le, le processus. Ce que j'ai vu, c'est que j'ai mesuré la quantité de sucre qu'il y avait dans les plantes. Euh, en fonction de, de les feuillages. Hein, voilà, le, donc, le brix, c'est la teneur en sucre. Le, là, on est sur le pourcentage des feuillages et j'ai vu qu'on avait un optimum euh, puisque les plantes sont armées pour faire la photosynthèse et qu'en fait, elles n'ont euh, pas de sucre sur elles. Il faut admettre qu'elles l'injectent dans le sol et on a un, un optimum qui est ici autour de 40% des feuillages et très certainement, chaque plante doit avoir son optimum des feuillages et elle doit envoyer des signaux, des signaux gustatifs aux, aux animaux pour qu'ils prennent la quantité acceptable. On peut supposer que l'écosystème se soit sélectionné comme ça. Et je conclurai que euh, on peut supposer que ce système soit impossible, impossible à mécaniser et qu'il faille recourir euh, aux vaches. Et voilà, je vous remercie pour votre attention. Depuis quelque temps, je m'amuse à faire des maquettes pour essayer de comprendre comment la température des surfaces influence les précipitations. Enfin, je l'ai compris, mais je veux le visualiser. Donc là, on a un montage avec les mêmes températures de surface et on avait les mêmes flux de pluie sur le côté. Et là, on voit qu'à mesure qu'on fait chauffer, ça modifie la quantité d'eau qu'on pourrait récupérer, euh, qui pleut et qu'on pourrait récupérer dans le sol. Et on peut même arriver, euh, quand le sol est relativement chaud, euh, ben à... bon, après on sait tous que dans les déserts il n'y a pas de pluie on voit qu'il ne pleut plus du tout on récupère plus de, de pluie donc on voit que quand les sols sont froids les pluies peuvent s'écouler normalement et tomber alors que quand ils sont chauds ben on a des mouvements convectifs et on peut même repousser les nuages en fait. donc, et après ça c'est important pour le climat parce que plus les nuages sont hauts en altitude plus on va avoir des nuages réchauffants qui vont réchauffer le, le système donc, garder des plantes longues, ça permet d'avoir une ration du climat et de garder des sols frais et d'avoir la pluie. Donc, aussi dans la façon dont euh, on peut expliquer qu'on améliore vite 
euh, les performances du système, c'est qu'on a vu qu'il y avait les polymères, on peut stocker l'eau, mais aussi peut-être on fait tomber plus de pluie sur les endroits. Et en tout cas, pour en avoir discuté avec les climatologues, euh, la région de Gay Brown, il y a beaucoup de gens qui ont fait ça. Et les climatologues disent, oui, mais là-bas, euh, parce que je leur montrais que les températures étaient plus froides au niveau global, ils me disent, non, mais là-bas, c'est qu'on a changé les courants d'air et il y a plus de pluie. Mais peut-être aussi, c'est parce qu'en pâturant autrement, on a un impact sur le climat. Voilà, donc normalement, donc, euh, ces questions euh, m'intéressent beaucoup. Je suis parti de l'angle de séquestration carbone et je me suis posé les questions de euh, quel impact ça pouvait avoir sur le climat. Et voilà, aujourd'hui, j'en suis à ces niveaux-là. Et avec des discussions assez euh, poussées avec des climatologues, donc un stage et une thèse, et aussi des climatologues qui ont envie de venir voir sur le terrain, euh, de voir donc, ce que je leur montrais, je n'en ai pas parlé là, mais on améliore aussi beaucoup l'infiltration. Guy Brown nous dit être passé de 12 mm heure à 200 mm heure, et aujourd'hui, il a 760 mm heure. Donc, euh, c'est sûr que si on a un typhon qui s'abat, on n'arrivera pas à infiltrer 760 mm heure, parce que là, on mesure, les agronomes mesurent avec un petit disque, c'est que sur 20 cm. Mais euh, on peut supposer qu'on pourrait avoir un bien, bien... Enfin, que je pense que l'homme a inventé les, les inondations en, en cassant le travail de la nature, et des racines, des vers de terre, et euh, les glomalines. Et, et, enfin, ce qu'il faut comprendre, je pense, c'est que la nature, c'est 500 millions d'années de R&D, et qu'il y a des, des stratégies qui sont très, très subtiles. Euh, par exemple, on a l'ambroisie qui pullule en ce moment dans le Lauragais, qui est une plante des zones semi-désertiques. Elle est capable d'envoyer de, des pollens. Qui, normalement, les pollens ils vont être capables de condenser l'eau et de faire tomber la pluie. L'ambroisie fait des pollens très fins qui vont empêcher les pluies de tomber. Parce qu'elle, elle supporte le climat sec et peut-être elle élimine sa concurrence pour, euh, s'il y a moins de pluie, elle, elle est sûre de prospérer puisqu'elle sait faire avec. Donc voilà, il faut... Du coup, j'ai développé ces notions. Je suis allé jusqu'à des notions d'agroécoclimatologie qui intègrent toutes ces notions un peu subtiles. Euh, on voit aussi que les plantes mycorhizées vont être capables... Le, le climat, ce qu'il faut comprendre, c'est que si on emploie l'eau, qu'on ne l'envoie pas assez vite, on ne va pas arriver à... Pour faire un nuage gris, il faut beaucoup, beaucoup d'eau. Et il est gris, le nuage, parce qu'il réfléchit les rayons lumineux et il nous tient au frais. On voit que c'est frais. Par contre, si on n'arrive pas à envoyer assez d'eau assez vite, eh bien, l'eau, vous savez aussi, c'est un gaz à effet de serre. Et du coup, ça demande d'envoyer plus d'eau. Et si on ne colle pas... En fait, le bon système, la bonne vision qu'il faut avoir, le système sol-plante est l'amortisseur du climat. Et vous savez qu'en compétition automobile ou euh, sport, VTT, etc., à un moment donné, ça se joue à, à des réglages de suspension très, très fins. Et ce qu'il faut comprendre, c'est qu'en changeant les plantes, en, en empêchant l'eau d'aller dans les sols, en enlevant les champignons, les mycorhizes, on dérègle nos, nos amortisseurs climatiques, en fait. L'an dernier, la France, c'était la canicule. Cette année, dans le sud de la France, on a eu, vous voyez que quand il commence à pleuvoir, après, il pleut tout le temps, parce que c'est aussi l'eau nous sert à refroidir, à fabriquer les nuages, à refroidir le système. On a des boucles de rétroaction, comme ça. Et bien, en fait... Euh, en déréglant nos amortisseurs, mais des fois, on fait des sorties de trajectoire, on quitte la piste et il faut qu'on arrive à recoller à, notre, à ce que nous demande l'atmosphère. Some fascinating stuff. Merci beaucoup, Cédric. And uh, we're going to stay in France and meet Monsieur Thomas Legrand, who is the lead technical advisor of the Conscious Food Systems Alliance, which is convened by the United Nations Development Programme to explore the inner dimensions that will help facilitate food systems transformation. On this World Full Day 2023, our message is to advocate the recognition of the importance of inner capacities for food systems transformation. We need to acknowledge you know, the important role of mindset, worldviews, values in the transition uh, we are uh, undergoing. And we need to show there are practical ways to take this into account, to integrate that dimension into our, our efforts for more regenerative food systems. The Conscious Food Systems Alliance is a movement that brings together 
uh, people from across food systems together with uh, what we call consciousness practitioners so that we can find a way to uh, together to cultivate the inner capacities that activate systemic change and regeneration because we are living in, in very uh, very difficult times especially for uh, for farmers who are the, you know the first impacted by, by climate change but also for for change agents on the ground uh, a, a lot of them get uh, burnout and you know how to take care of oneself how to take care of strong emotions also like fear for example or anger uh, in order you know to reduce also polarization in the discussions we have we are really advocating for uh, the importance of considering and acknowledging you know the role of what's happening inside each of us in this uh, big transition we are, are called to to undergo so how can we you know better take into account mindsets values worldviews and how can we cultivate uh, these inner capacity that we think can foster regeneration so we want to demonstrate not only that is needed but there are also practical effective ways uh, to work on that so indeed we have identified different areas of intervention for these agendas throughout the food systems uh, starting you know at the, at the local level where uh, production happens uh, looking you know for example at uh, farmers well-being and psychological resilience and how to support, you know, the the cultivate the, the mindsets, the, the, the regenerative mindsets for farmers to adopt more regenerative practices. Uh, we are also uh, having a dialogue with indigenous people and on the role of traditional wisdom, how we can, you know, strengthen uh, these uh, traditional uh, wisdom, traditional practices, how we can make sure they are passed on to the next generation and disseminated in their communities. Um, how we can approach, you know, multi-stakeholders, dialogues, policy processes in a different manner, uh, especially building self-transformative and connecting spaces for deeper discussions and starting, you know, our, our reflection on policies from a place of connection to self, others and nature, uh, how we can uh, evolve organizational cultures uh, to make uh, them more conscious uh, in the way we are working together and uh, finally you know on consumption how we can often we see that especially in the global south um, traditional diets are depreciated uh, and social status is associated with western imported food how we can revert that and how we can you know use uh, practices such as mindful eating to uh, support more sustainable and healthy diets so you know, really looking at taking a system-wide approach uh, and, and looking at uh, where are key uh, leverage points uh, for food system transformations through the cultivation of inner capacities. We have a dialogue right now with uh, indigenous people and local communities on the role of traditional wisdom for uh, in regenerative food systems. Uh, how we can, as I said, you know, ensure this knowledge is uh, is identified, documented, protected, and disseminated within their communities. Uh, so we are having, you know, we are developing a, a roadmap on what we would like to do with indigenous people and local communities on this agenda. Uh, of course, uh, we are uh, really taking a specific approach uh, in. Um, in uh, with you know inner capacities as a complementary approach. Uh, often we see that uh, indigenous people, local communities have a much more integrated aspect, uh, integrated approach. Sorry, um, and you know where it is difficult, you know, to um, separate, you know, the the wisdom, the culture from actual practices like you know uh, conserving the seeds, for example, etc. But uh, yes, we are we are working uh, together on developing a common agenda on these issues. Welcome to COFSA, the Conscious Food Systems Alliance. It is now time to unlock food systems transformation for the nourishment of all people and the regeneration of the planet.
Global food systems are at breaking point and our current policy solutions and technical innovations are not delivering the change we need. To create more regenerative systems, we need to access deeper levers of change. Crisis begins within us in how we see and relate to the world. While food connects us fundamentally with the earth and with one another, the current global food system is shaped by a deep cultural story of separation that sets individuals apart from other beings and with nature. This inner disconnection manifests in dysfunctional food systems. Hungry children, obesity epidemics, and farmers' despair. Extractive production practices, devastated landscapes, and biodiversity loss. While these issues are embedded in structural inequalities and the disempowerment of the most marginalized stakeholders, they are also rooted in our collective consciousness. To activate solutions, we must therefore also look within shifting the collective ways of being, thinking and doing that have produced the current crisis. The time has come to build the inner foundations of sustainable food systems. The Conscious Food Systems Alliance, COFSA, is a movement of food, agriculture and consciousness practitioners convened by UNDP and united around a common goal. To support people from food and agriculture systems to cultivate the inner capacities that activate systemic change and regeneration. We aim to complement existing approaches, exploring ways to integrate evidence-based consciousness practices such as mindfulness, compassion, nature connection, non-violent communication, self-reflection into food systems initiatives. These practices foster the awareness, connection and creativity that can unlock structural solutions. We know that these practices are effective and their value in supporting sustainability at multiple levels is increasingly recognized. We also know that there are not new. Indigenous and traditional wisdom have embraced these practices for millennia within a holistic understanding of food and the natural world. Hofstra offers a bold vision on the role of consciousness in food system transformation. Around this shared purpose, diverse stakeholders are uniting, co-creating and adapting approaches to their own contexts and learning from each other. Reconnection begins here. Join a growing community of practitioners exploring pathway toward conscious food systems.